Y'all didn't know I was going to preach. A lot of you came today. <laughs> you know, the other, hey, hey we're, gonna, we're partnering with a ministry to help the poor at Thanksgiving, and we're buying 200 turkeys. They're about $20 a turkey. We're getting about 10, 12-pound turkeys. We're getting a good price from Hy-Vee. And uh, if, if you have a $20 bill, you don't mind sharing, or a $1, whatever, but let's do something really generous. I'm going to ask these guys to come help us pick this up. And while they do that, uh, I just wanted to mention that I'm a little, little frustrated because these other pastors all get the good topics, you know. They get, you know, Jesus is light. Light, well, whatever, light, you know. They, he's truth. He's the door. He's the, you know, he's bread. Everybody likes to eat. And I get Jesus is the true vine. And if you're not in him, you're going to be cut off and burned in hell forever, uh, you know. So great. Take your Bibles. Turn to John 15. Hey, ladies, while you're turning to John 15, uh, Lynn Parker, I don't know if Lynn's in here, but her husband, Phil, is one of the chaplains at uh, Methodist West. They're great people. She's a Southerner. She is funny as can be. If you want to take, you want to invest some money in a meal, take them out to eat, and it will be the most delightful evening you've ever had. But she's the speaker at the Women's Breakfast. Don't miss it. It's also a season saint event coming up. Be sure you look for that in your bulletin. And um, one, one last thing I just wanted to mention is those that are going to Branson, we're not going to leave from the student campus. We're going to leave from this building, park on the southeast close to Townsend, but on this side of the street, down with facing that wooden fence or somewhere over in there, the bus will be over here, okay? If you know of anybody not here, get a hold of them and tell them. Well, you can hear I'm a little hoarse I'm on the backside of a cold <clears throat> getting there. I sound like a... Uh, I think I sound like a frog that got hit by a semi-truck, uh, run over. Uh, and so, pray for me. This morning, in the close of most services, we're going to offer a time of prayer. No matter what you need, whether it's a physical healing, you might need to be set free from a stronghold in your life. You might need to uh, ask Jesus to enter into your heart and mind in a very real way, to change you, to forgive you. Uh, you might need a, to devote yourself in a deeper walk with God or, uh, or financial provision or a relationship issue. Whatever it might be, at the close of the service, I'm going to be saying, would you like to come and be prayed for? And I'm going to invite others that know how to pray for others. We don't have assigned people only that can pray. Then come and please help us pray with those that respond. And uh, when you come, it doesn't mean you're responding to the message that I'm giving. It means that you just want someone to pray with you or you want to come pray. So please feel free to come. No one is trying to figure out why you're coming. Uh, in our text, verse 1 to 3, the point one is understanding the text. Verse 1 of John 15 says, I'm the true vine and my father is the gardener. He takes away every branch that does not bear fruit in me. He prunes every branch that bears fruit so it will bear more fruit. You are clean already because of the word that I have spoken to you. In John chapter 13 and 14, Jesus is telling his the followers, his disciples particularly, that he's going to die. He's going to go away from them. He's going to suffer. Uh, he, you know, there's going to, you know, and, and they're not getting it. Finally, at the end of 16, he makes it plainer, and they finally get it. He goes, oh, good, finally you got it. And, uh, and then in chapter 16, he's telling them, you're going to have a lot of trouble in this world, too. You're going to be hated because I'm hated. And there's going to be people going to mock you. They're going to kill you. They're going to come against you. You're going to have trouble. So isn't it good news that Jesus is giving his disciples? Remember John 16, I believe it's 33, says, in this world you'll have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. He's talking to his disciples. going to have trouble. And right in the middle is John 15. And in John 15, he says these words about abiding in him. I'm the true vine and you need to abide in me. And um, they don't really get it because they, all they knew was the external law that was written on tablets of stone to walk with God in obedience. And they didn't have the internal witness of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit. The day of Pentecost had not happened. The Holy Spirit had not come to enter a man to place his life and his word and write it on the heart of flesh into our hearts. Are you with me? The Holy Spirit didn't come. So John 16, they're going, you know, Jesus is realizing they're fearful. They're upset. They don't understand. What, are you going to go away? They said, we don't want you to go away. He says, hey, 
it's good that I go away. If I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't come. And when he comes, he'll lead and guide you into all truth, and he will convict you of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. He will comfort you. He will be all these things to you. He's going to help you in so many ways. So i got to go away so the Holy Spirit can be in you, and that's the power better that the Spirit be in you than Jesus still be here physically and limited to, to the group that he walks around with, which was mostly those disciples. So in the middle of this, he tells them something that they don't get. How do I abide in you, Jesus? And he says, I am the true vine. He speaks to himself as the true vine. And um, in John 1, 9, you know, he who created the light says, I am the true light. Mentions the true light, John 1, 9. And then the bread, you know, and, and he references it in this passage that God gave Israel in the wilderness when he sustained them with manna from above and dropped them in the wilderness for the Israelites. Uh, Jesus identify himself through this and communicating today, I'm the true bread. And today, he says, I'm the true vine, just like that. And by the way, the bread passage is John 6, 30 to 35. And he identifies himself as the true vine. And listen carefully, those of you that are Bible scholars, and most of you that go right over your head because you don't know what I'm going to say. He says, I'm the true vine, the full and final revelation of all that the vine anticipated and foreshadowed in the Old Testament. I could preach now for 30 minutes on Isaiah chapter 5, but go home, write it down, and read it. Because in that it says that Israel is the vine. Okay? And so a part of the listeners are listening to Jesus, and I believe that, that there's multiple people being spoken to here, but some of them thinking that, they're, that they are true believers because they're followers of Abraham. They don't get it that it's only through Jesus Christ because Israel is the vine. And in that Isaiah passage, it basically says how Israel had failed God. But Jesus never fails, and Jesus, he identified himself and the Israelites the, those that were following the Jewish and had not come to Christ as Savior, he's communicating something when he says the true vine. Not Israel, I am the one, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And so, and then us as believers, we're branches in this story. And the father's the vine dresser or the gardener, the one who tends the vine. And uh, every branch which doesn't bear fruit in the vine is removed by the father. As we'd expect this verse this verse is very confusing to some with, other theo with theo different theology perspectives. And because the word takes away in verse 2, if you put up verse 2 of, of John uh, chapter 15, it says, I think it says cut, uh, cuts off, but the uh, one version says takes away. That word, the Greek word, can mean lift up, clean off. So you picture a vine and you're bearing fruit, the grape. The grapevine, it gets down and it's kind of laying in the ground and the dirt gets over it and it's kind of being smothered and it's dirty and because it doesn't have any air and the breath and all that, it kind of is not doing very good. It's not bearing fruit very good. It's puny, pathetic fruit. And so it could be that verse 2 is saying because this word that is translated cuts off and or is translated uh, uh, removes or uh, takes away, uh, it could mean that he lifts up that that, that vine and cleans it off and begins to help it nourish and grow. Now, verse 6 is obviously, we're not there yet, but verse 6 in John 15 is obviously cut off, unbeliever, not walking with God. They're not true believers, and they'll be sent to eternal destruction. But verse 2 could be either one. Now, I've stated it out very thoroughly, and I'm okay with whatever you want to take because the whole picking up and cleaning off and the bare fruit is definitely a part of God's nature, and you see it other places, so I don't have a problem with it. But the word can all, and he, and he could have meant dual meaning. Could have meant dual meaning in both of them. I don't know. And uh, it doesn't really matter to me. What matters to me is that you abide in Christ, but I just wanted to bring out the interpretation of the text or understanding this text. Uh, the Greek word, uh, it, so it could be translated, lifts up. So, but to really get a hold of Scripture, when you want to interpret it, since I was frustrated and trying to figure it out for sure, I picked three other passages in the Gospels, uh, two in Matthew and one in Mark, to try to help understand the text. Matthew 3, 7 to 10. Now, here's the thing. I know that these, you can carry them around. You got them anyway. You can pull up Scripture, Right? But you can't, unless you're really better than me, you, it's hard to write. I like to write in my Bible. So if you've got, if you've got a paper Bible, it's better. Start bringing it and writing that thing. It, it's okay. Uh, there's, you know, 
the Jews used to have a problem with that because, you know, the way they approached Scripture because everything was external and law-driven. But this is relationship-driven, and these books that we have here can be written in. It's not desecrating the Scripture. Matthew 3, verse 7. Oh, I love Pastor Zach always says, note-takers or world-changers. There we go. I said it, Zach. By the way, have you ever noticed how Pastor Luke with his little hair looks like Rooster in the, in the movie, uh, you know, what's that movie? What? Annie. Yeah, in the movie Annie. I love him. You know, I told him not to be cutting that hair off short over here, and he went out that afternoon and cut that hair short like this. I said, get, it, get stylish. Cut it short here and grow it long here. I'm setting the trend. I don't know what's wrong with him. Matthew 3, verse 7. All right. Sometimes I just get off on stupid stuff. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, now these are branches of the Jews, coming to where he was baptizing, just as John, he was John the Baptist, baptizing, he said of them, John said, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Look at this, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, some of you, you have this religious fruit, but it's not repentance fruit, it's not true. He says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So indeed, in John 15, Jesus, I mean, yes, that he's speaking, could have been talking to those Juda, uh, Judaizers, the Isra Isra Israelis, the Hebrews, that think that they're okay just being children of Abraham. And they're following the Old Testament, the law, and they haven't come in the repentance of Jesus Christ and come into relationship with Jesus Christ. And indeed, here we're talking about the same thing about a tree that doesn't bear fruit gets cut down. So um, uh, they're dead trees. They're unbelievers. That's what he's talking about, a dead tree. Okay? All right. One of the problems, and then turn to Matthew 7, just flip over a little bit. One of the problems with this passage is it's easy for you to think of this dead limb like, you know, I'm abiding and I used to be really close to God and I've kind of slipped away and I know I'm really far away. So, okay, God's going to clip me off and then burn me someday and I can't do anything about it. Dr. Wade Nunley said in a teaching that I, I, I was reading recently about apostasy and some of these things like this, he said, if the Holy Spirit is still drawing you and convicting you, you're probably pretty okay. And the thing is, is this could be a very hopeless message, but it's not, because that's not what the Scripture's saying. He's not saying that once you walk with Jesus, you got kind of away over here, and, and, and so you're done, you're over, I'm gonna chop you off. Now, is there a place where a person kind of never got it, or for whatever reason, uh, that I can't explain, they, they just kind of live themselves in, into apostasy or, or just religious nothingness and, 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 you know, they look like the vine, they're cut off, they're not bearing fruit. I don't know. I'm not going to go into that. I don't know. But you can figure it out. Book of Matthew 7 talks about false prophets. So this could be, uh, uh, you know, evangelists, uh, um, uh, missionaries, it could be pastors, it could be teachers in the church. It doesn't have to be anybody paid. It could be a lot of people claiming to be from God, to speak for God. Watch out, false prophets that come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're voracious wolves. Uh, Matthew 7, uh, starting in verse 15. They, uh, the, inwardly they're voracious wolves. By their fruit you'll recognize them. Do pe people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bear, bears bad fruit. That's easy to understand. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. A bad tree can't bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit says every tree that does not bear good fruit, verse number 19, is cut down and thrown to the fire. Thus by their fruit you'll recognize them. Not every one of you that says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father is in heaven. Well, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and your name drive out demons and and uh, perform many miracles, and I'll tell you plainly, I never knew you away from you, you evildoers. In other words, if you're not a fruit bearer, you're a doctrine believer, you're a church attender, but you may not be a part of Christ. That's, that's a problem. And uh, so true prophets can false prophets can be distinguished by their fruits. So uh, it really kind of gives us an idea of what is a true believer. 
Now, for some of you that are guilt-ridden, you made mistakes in the past, the devil points a finger, kind of has you under his thumb because he doesn't want you to wake up to the joy of salvation. And you're sitting here and go, oh man, I did this, I did that, and you've, then this, these verses can really mess with you. Don't let that happen. That's not what I'm offering. I'm offering you to come to Jesus and get fully devoted, get connected, and begin to bear that which is true fruit. The third text we read is Mark 4, 1 to 2, which is the parable of the sowers. So if you turn to Mark chapter 4, verses 1 to 20, rather. Mark 4 says, again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in and out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables and in teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. That's where they had walked along the path that was hardened, not, not soft soil. The birds ate it. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil, so they couldn't get roots. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they were withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns. The thorns represent, they the, grew up and choked the plants, and so they didn't bear grain. And still other seed fell on good soil and uh, came up and grew and produced a crop multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. And uh, then Jesus said, he who has the ear, ears to hear, let him hear. And then skip down to verse 13 of uh, Mark 4. Jesus said, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. So the seed is the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the world is sown, the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, the word is, they hear the word, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. That's on the path. Others, like seed sown in the rocky places, they hear the word, and at once they receive it with joy. But since they have no root, did I do something to my mic there? Sorry. Since they have no root, um, they last, it, they last only a short time. And when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. In other words, when you're living for God, living for Christ, someone mocks you, ridicules you, persecutes you, comes against you. When trouble comes and everything isn't just rosy as your little Christian pink as can be world and things aren't just perfect because you're not in heaven yet, right? Then you go, you throw in the towel. You're not able to say it as well like Barb. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth and the desires of other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. We've heard that twice, and the proof of the, the fact of the matter is that in this parable, you hear that the first three people that respond to the seed sown because of the path, the birds get it because of the rocky soil, no, the rocky ground, no, no depth, no roots, or because of the cares of the world, they take it away and it, they get choked out by the, the whatever. Listen, those people never came to Christ. They, those people, they showed signs of life. They showed little, little signs that they might really have gotten Christ, but they didn't. But it's the ones where the roots grew, the seed produced, that they, and they had fruit from them, that represents the genuine believer. So the first soil rejects the gospel immediately. The second and third soils appear to have life for a time, but it's not until persecution and hard times come to you that you see that that seed does not take root or produce fruit. The seeds sprout, they appear to be lively, but ultimately they fail to produce any fruit. So we're trying to understand the text. Understanding the text. First notice in understanding the text that the vine uh, the, the, the purpose of the vine is to bear fruit. Jesus is the true vine. His purpose was to bear fruit. When he was up on earth, he bore fruit everywhere. All right? Secondly, and, and, and so the branches are the instrument which God chooses to bear his fruit. So the instrument through which fruit is produced is us, the branches. So we now, because he's in heaven, has sent his spirit that his life flow through us to produce Jesus' fruit on earth. Okay. Third, the branches only bear fruit in union with the vine. Apart from me, says you can do nothing. If I'm not connected to the vine, then I'm useless because I have no nutrition, no real life, 
nothing like that. Fourth, the father is the gardener. He tends the vine. Uh, he's the one that removes the lifeless, fruitless branches that never truly were in the vine, but only supposed themselves to be. He cleanses, the, may, may, he's the one that if, if you take, he, he lifts up, he lifts up those fruitless ones and brushes them off and helps them, or in the spring he prunes them back. And by the way, this father that prunes us back, James, the half-brother of Jesus, said that tribulation comes to be joyful because it produces uh, fullness, it produces uh, uh, complete completion or maturity or spiritual growth and protection. And when you get pruned as a, a true vine and he prunes it back in the spring, that vine looks ugly. It looks terrible. It looks like my haircut when I get my haircut right away. And, and, and so, and it's not pleasant. But neither was it pleasant for Jesus when he went to the cross. And you know, it doesn't mean it's a bad thing for us to go through hard times because God is conforming us and he's more interested in eternal character than he is temporary blessedness. So um, he's not here just to fill our cups with pleasure for us and give us the great American life. Didn't you love the missionary last week when she said, she said, uh, she said, here we are as Americans, she's in Africa, you know. Here we are as Americans, we're eating our steak and just whining about everything. I thought, wow, that really hurt. I'm not, from now on when I go to Texas Roadhouse, I am not whining about anything. I don't care how loud they turn that stupid music. Oh, okay. And then also, not only is the father the gardener who tends the vine, but the instrument is the Word of God that he uses to, to tend the vine. So the Bible says in, in, in Hebrews 4.12 that the Word is sharper, two-edged sword is sharper than any two-edged sword, and it's able to cut and sunder right to the heart and soul. It cuts deeply. It goes into us, and it produces more fruit. So as the father works with us as the vine. He's trimming back, and it's not pleasant. He's working with us. It's sharp, but it also is that same word that judges, because in the end, the word is true. And so those that are actually false and not really believers are going to get cut off, take, and the Scripture says, burn. You see, how many have seen, noticed that a lot of books written about success and that type of thing? Uh, you know, and, and how to be successful, how to do this, and to pastors, to everything. And, you know, and our goal is not to be, is not success, it's salvation, to go into the world. Jesus sent us not to be successful in this world, but to get people saved, salvations. Not to get even, but to forgive and to love. Our goal is not to be popular, but faithful. Our goal is not to be sexy, but sanctified and holy, set apart for God. Our goal is not to be rich in the things of this world, but full of the Holy Spirit of God. Our goal is not to become an all-American, but to become an all-Christian, all-in. It's not getting all this world offers in activity and entertainment, but it's about giving, giving of all that we are, our talent, our time, our treasure, everything for the purposes of God. And so we get the understanding of this text and now we get the meaning in verses 4 to 8, John 15, the meaning of abide in John chapter 15. Starting in verse number 4, it says this, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If a, a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he's like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask what you wish, and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Show yourselves to be my disciples. Showing yourselves, rather, to be my disciples. This is to the Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Showing yourselves to be my disciples. In other words, we're showing Christ and his spirit. So, First, we got to get, what are we talking about here when we say abide? Well, the Greek word for abide here uh, can be translated in a lot of different ways. In the King James Bible, 120 times this Greek word is used. And in 61 of them, it's translated abide. In uh, 16 times, it's translated remain, same word. 15 times dwell, 11 times continue, tarry, 9 times endure, three times, and it has a place of residence or where a person is staying, like staying overnight or in a home where they're staying while they're somewhere. It's mentioned several times, including 
uh, in the scriptures uh, where it starts in uh, John 1, 38 and 39, mark it down, where it, and I'll read that. It says, Jesus turned around and saw them and following and said to them, Why, what do you want? So they said to the rabbi, uh, which means teacher, where are you staying? That word staying, translate staying, where are you staying? That's the word for remain or abide. Where are you abiding? Where are you remaining? Uh, where, where are you tearing? Where are you continuing? Where are you dwelling? So he's talking about where he is. And he says, after this, he went to Capernaum in John 2, 12, and with his mother and brothers and disciples, and they stayed there a few days. Same Greek word for remain or abide. Why am I saying that? Because my point is this. When it says abide, it means make a permanent home for. Hear me? Abide in Christ as a true vine is to make our home in him just as he makes his abode or his home in us. And if you want to stress the word remain, the aspect of that word is to make our permanent home. You see, this Greek word, there is no one English word that captures it all. You can't say it in one English word. That's why we have it translated differently. And to get a hold of it is to make, to make a permanent home with Jesus, with him, the dwelling place. Psalms mentions it. In Psalm 91, uh, the idea of God having uh, God as our dwelling place. It says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High abides under the shadow of the Almighty because you, made me, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, verse 10. And so, verse, verse 9 rather, verse 10 says, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. That has to do with home, the place of dwelling. We want to dwell where the Lord is. I, I used to, we used to sing a song, I think it was a Don Moen song back in the 80s, and he says, I want to be where you are. Let me know this. Dwelling in your presence, feasting at your table, surrounded by your glory in your presence. That's where I always want to be. I just want to be. I just want to be with you. Dwelling with him. John 14, in my father's house are many mansions, King James, many rooms, NIV, others dwelling places. Same idea. That it's a, a separate word that's a cousin to the word here in this text because it's in heaven. It's speaking of a heavenly dwelling. And the Bible mentions in Revelation that he will come and tabernacle with us, and we will, he will be our God, and we will be with him. So you think about if it's a permanent dwelling place of the home, and it means uh, having to make our permanent home Jesus Christ. What is home? Think, what does it mean to you? Home is where the heart is. Uh, it's where you want to be, especially during the holidays. That's where home is the place you return to the place you're eager to get back to after you've been on a cruise too long. Home is where you feel comfortable. You can really be yourself. That's, that's Jesus. Home is a place of safety and security. That's Jesus. Home is where you bring your friends when you wish to have fellowship with them. True fellowship is with Jesus and his spirit with us. The truth, holiness, and love, and truth, and light. Home is our base of operations. It's the center of what we do. Home is where you find your strength for life. It's where you eat, where you sleep. Home is where the people and the things that we love the most are found. And isn't that what Jesus Christ should be for us? Our place of home. Understanding the text, the meaning, and the instruction on inviting. In verses 9 to 17 of chapter 15. I pick up. As the Father has loved me, so I've loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I've loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends you are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know what his master's, his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything I've learned from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. There it is again. I've chosen you, appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is the commandment 
This is my command, love each other. So right in the middle of this, John 13, chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, during this process, these guys are arguing who's going to be the greatest in God's kingdom. They're wanting to know who's going to be on the right side, who's going to be on the left side. They're arguing about all this, and he said, you know, the, he becomes a servant, you know, he washes their feet during this time. He says, I do this to his example. Why? Because he's not going to be around. He knows he's going to go away. He's going to leave these guys with his kingdom, and they're going to argue about who's what, and they're not going to love each other. He's saying, wait just a minute. Listen to me. This is what the deal is. I'm sitting in my spirit. My spirit is love. God is love. The Bible says God is love, and those who do not love do not know God. They don't have God, and they can't have God because God is love. And you can't say you got God unless you love. So he said, I've loved the Father, and i proved it by obeying. I've done everything the Father told me to do. And I've loved you. And I said, I'm going to tell you to start loving each other. The church, love each other as I've loved you. Because I need you to do this because unless you do this, no one's going to believe you because by your fruits you shall know them. By your love they will know you're my disciples, he says. This is all in these chapters. So you see, the instruction on abiding is very important that we understand something here. That first of all, that when we abide in Christ, number one, we abide in his love. That's it. We love. And so many times we're so quick to hold a grudge, we don't forgive. We're not merciful. We talk about people. When a person is trying to do something right and do something for God, they're not very good at it. We criticize them behind their back. We love each other that look like us, that act like us, that have the same money as us. And God wants us to love everybody unconditionally with his grace. And when you get Jesus in your heart, that's the way you love. And when you love like that, the world will stand up and take notice and say, oh, there's something there different. And that's what the Holy Spirit, the most important thing, is the love that we have one for another. And they'll know we're his disciples, followers of Jesus. The second thing is when we abide in Christ, we keep his commandments. God gave commandments, the law. Isn't it a shame that there's other organizations that don't believe in Jesus Christ, the living God, the dwelling of the Spirit, that from the external thing, they can live more holy according to God's word, according to God's law, than we could. You're getting into shame that the Old Testament Jews, when the law was written on tablets of stone, that they could obey and follow God and study that word and have it in their mind and focus and do good and live way holier. And we use grace. And we, like it says, we knowingly do against God. It is treading on the blood of Jesus and insulting, the Hebrew writer said, the spirit of grace. And we could care less about following God. And you know what? The thing is, the, the Jews didn't know that that law was given because of love, but we know that. God's law and love are inseparable. Deuteronomy 7, 9, God told them, but they just couldn't get it. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God and faithful God who keeps covenant and shows mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. Loving and obedience are one and the same. Jesus inseparably joins love and commandment keeping. The Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees. They assembled together, verse 34, verse 35, and one of them, an expert in religious law, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is the first commandment. The second is like that, and that is to love your neighbors yourself. And God, those that love, those, those that have fruit, bear fruit, they will love and they will obey. They will keep his commandments. The third thing we do is we love each other. And I've already spoken enough, but John 13, 34, 35 says, Jesus said, I give you a new commandment to love one another. Just as I've loved you, you are also to love one another. Everyone will know that this, know by this, that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. And the fourth thing, principle we see, is how you live it out, how do you abide, is we have great joy. Joy first in the fact that we've experienced the joy of Jesus Christ because he's in us. Secondly, we have a special joy because the disciples did because they saw him die and they scattered and they were fearful, but they had faith when they saw him risen again and the resurrection ought to bring great joy to us as followers. The third thing is this one of the fruit of the Spirit, the Spirit of God in us. The fourth thing that joy has is that because when we're born again Christians, we were taken from death to life. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. We now, we had no future and no hope. Now we have a plan and a purpose as was prophesied as God as we seek him. And we have a hope and that hope is Jesus Christ. And, that, and, and we should have joy as Christians because we have faith in Jesus Christ. We're born again. And fifth, 
We have joy because we're bringing in others. We're sharing the gospel. We're seeing people come to Christ. Bring, we shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves, right? There should be joy. That's what the Bible teaches, what joy. And some of you are just bring joy to me. And, and then also that when there's joy because when we abide with him, he hears us and he answers our prayer. As it said at the end of the last passage, he answers prayer. And what joy it is when you see God do something that man can't do, miracles, right? So we have a couple that's moving to, uh, to Houston in, in uh, Cyprus, right where we went and did the flood thing, where my cousin pastors. And, and they're going to leave this Thursday. Where are you guys at? Bob and Karen, stand up. And she's been healed totally of fibromyalgia. Karen stepped out. She, she stepped out a minute. I'm sorry she didn't know. But yes, give God praise. Right? Healed totally fibromyalgia. And it was crippling. In fact, they built a house, a handicapped home for a wheelchair. She was that sick, and she doesn't need it. And they're moving to Cyprus as God has led them there. The, and then the last thing is we're not called just, we're, we're not just slaves, but we're his friends. When we abide in Christ, we become the friends of Jesus. The disciples called themselves slaves still, but Jesus called them friends. And let me, I want you to catch this really clear and easy. Just listen to me a second. The word used here about friend when it goes back, it had a specific meaning to mean friend of a king. It was speaking, he's speaking of royalty, the court of the king, and how the king was the authority, but they were right there, they were close, and the king welcomed them in, not only as subjects, but as friends, and would share things with them. And you have a king, and yes, you are his servant. Jesus taught us to be servants, but you also are his friend. And lay your life down. In conclusion, there are two things that keep us from abiding, and I'm almost done. The first that is detrimental to us, that keep us from obeying and walking in his love and abiding, is complacency. A false sense that we're self-sufficient and that we don't need to draw life and strength from God. Revelation 3, 14 to 7, it was the case of the church at Laodicea. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write the following. This is a solemn pronouncement. These things saith the amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that you were cold or hot, so that because thou art lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you out of my mouth, because thou sayest I'm rich and have gotten riches, and have need of nothing and know nothing, that thou art the wretched one and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Is that America? The Bible says, apart from me, you can do nothing, but with me all things are possible. What a, what a total contrast. With me all things are possible. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, if Jesus were to come physically back to earth and visit you in your home, he said, I'm going to stay. I'm going to abide with you for, I'm going to dwell with you for a week. Do you know that most of you are you're too busy? You'd have to say, Jesus, can you hang on? I got to go over here. I got to go take the kids. I got to do this. Oh, I've got this. I've got this. Can you just hang on over here? Oh, uh, run by Burger King. I'll give you some money. Get something to eat over here. Oh, I don't have time to sit down and talk. Oh, wait a minute. You want to talk to me about something deep? Oh, I don't, I don't have time for that. Really? I mean, seriously, think to yourself, what would you do? Would you clear your, what would you do? That's the second thing is we're stinking too busy to abide with Christ. We do more and more. Some of it's religious activity and, be, and stuff going on. Not that that's bad things. But I'm telling you, I don't know what's wrong with us that we think that we have to indulge our children in everything and anything. And anything they're in, we give it to them to the length. I mean, it's not enough to be on one soccer team. You've got to be on five. And you've got to do fall soccer and spring soccer because, after all, they're going to be all American. Oh, wait a minute. I heard of a guy who paid 20000 a year to this place, and they were going to train the athletes as they're growing up, and they guaranteed them a Division I scholarship. And I thought after four years, that's 80000 You can pretty much go where you want to. Maybe not, but anyway. I'm just saying the words effective and successful are found in Christian bookstores and magazines and all that, and what we need is to just simply walk with Jesus. I leave you with this final thought. If I, if, and, and I didn't bring it up here because I, I didn't have it, but I, 
If I were a little coffee cup, there's a hole in it. Here's how we try to fill ourselves with Jesus. We have Jesus who's like a river, it's like an ocean of water. And we come in and we have a little Sunday morning, we put a little dash of water in it and it's running out the bottom. We get back to Wednesday, let's get another breath, a drink of water. Put another drink in, it runs out the bottom, it drips out all week. And so we're trying to be Christian, but we're not abiding. And Jesus is inviting us into the water. He wants you to take that, your life, your vessel, and go into the water and be submerged and stay there and abide. And then if you really want to get closer to God, then he begins to break the sides of your cup down so that you die to yourself. A broken and a contrite heart God does not despise. And he begins to break it apart and break it apart where before long, the one and the same, the water, like uh, Sean was telling me, like putting lemonade in water. You can't, once it's there, you can't separate it. That Christ is so much in us and a part of us that we move, like Paul said, and have our being in him. We live, move, and have our being in him. I don't know about you, but this convicts me. I want more of Jesus. Will you bow your head with me? Can we all stand? Jesus, please help our people. And help me, God. Set us free. Touch us, God. Deliver us and free us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd like prayer this morning, I want to invite you to come for prayer. Sorry, Amber, I forgot to invite you down. Thank you. Why is it that we we make a big deal that we need prayer? I mean, prayer is listening to God and talking to God. The Bible says pray for one another. Why do we make that so weird? I go to a church when I'm in Dallas called Gateway. And at the close of every one of their services, he just says, if you'd like prayer for anything, come down. There are people lined up. There's probably the, 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 the campus I go to probably has 3,000 people there. There are aisles just like this, only maybe one or two more. And people come and they're lined up all the way up the aisle. And they get people praying for them. People come and accept Christ. They come renew their dedication. It's, it's nothing to be ashamed of to come and pray. That's a devil trick. The most important thing is your response to this message. Not hearing it and going, oh, good, Pastor, you even said something funny. Oh, you told me something I didn't know. Oh, well, la di da di da You don't get the biting of Jesus. You missed the whole point. So I invite you to come and eat the thing you need. If you need to put Jesus in your heart, forgive your sin, you need to devote yourself, you need a healing, anything you need, we invite you to come.